Hello and good evening. Thank you all for coming. I'm uh, Steve Hayward and I teach here in the uh, English department. Uh, I want to thank you. I want to begin by thanking you all for coming. Um, and before I say anything else, I also want to thank the various folk and funding agencies that have made uh, tonight possible. I want to begin with the English department and the unstoppable Paula Pine, uh, who's the logistical mastermind who makes all of this work and work well. I also want to thank the Academic Events Committee, uh, which is chaired this year by Ted uh, Lindemann and last year by Christine Sidaway. They supported this venture from the very beginning, and uh, as they have for so many other great writers that we've had over the years. Tonight is brought to you by the Lloyd Lecture Fund, and uh, I see many faces in the audience who've been here for some of some great writers, uh, including Colin McCann, who uh, and were in great debt to the Lloyd Lecture Fund. And uh, just as sort of a note for all of our current students, that when later you leave the precincts of Colorado College and make a billion dollars, remember this night. Remember this night and, uh, and that you were here when it comes time for you to make that huge gift uh, to Colorado College. I look forward to that. As you might imagine, an event like tonight doesn't just sort of fall into place. It's not something that just happens. And often people ask me what it's like. What is the process like? What does it feel like to run a Visiting Writers series? And I say, when asked such a question, which doesn't happen that often, but when it does happen, uh, I respond by saying it's a lot like uh, giving someone a book as a, as a gift. And yeah, the thing is that I'm the sort of person who, uh, who gives books as gifts. And, and perhaps you're that sort of person too. Perhaps you're somebody who thinks that it's all right to give a book as a gift. And if you're that person, you know that it's not always the case uh, that the present of a book is meant with unmixed joy. Often the response begins when you hand over the present and the person handles it and says, it feels, it feels like a book. <laughs> and I, I never know what to make of that. Uh, there's always that sort of moment, I, I, I don't know what to say. It, it, clearly it's a book. Uh, and it often makes me feel insecure when I get that response. It feels like a book. And what I say, and this is not a response for those of you who are like me and enjoy giving books and enjoy getting books. But if you enjoy giving books, it's, I say something then that does not always make the situation better. I say something along the lines of, it is a book and you're going to love it. <laughs> By which I think I mean something along the lines of, if you don't love it, we can't be friends anymore. There's something about handing over a book. There's something about that, that faith. There's something about that when you give someone a book, you say, read this. Read this because I love it, and I want you to love it. It's some form of pure human communion, that exchange of stories. And running a visiting writer's series is a lot like that. It's a lot like saying out loud and often, here is someone who is, here is a writer who has made a great deal to me. Here's someone who we need to hear on the campus of Colorado College. Here's an important voice of our time. And I will admit that there have been years when I have purchased too many Colin McCann novels and given them to too many people. In fact, not so long ago, I was talking with my wife about what to give as a birthday present, and I said, why don't we give her a copy of Transatlantic? And my wife's response, his true story was, you gave her that last year. <laughs> so I admit that I have a problem. I admit that I have a problem, and I admit that you're here today because of that problem. So thank you for being here. Uh, Colin McCann was born in Dublin, where his father was a journalist for an Irish press newspaper group. He followed in his father's footsteps and became a journalist himself, and was celebrated for his work, even at Colm. Uh, after working for various Irish newspapers, he left and went to live in Cape Cod. That's why we were talking about this with students today. Uh, he made a few, he, he talked about how he was 
he left his, his very promising career as a journalist in order to write a novel. He purchased a typewriter, he said, in a long uh, you know, spool of paper as if he was Kerouac and sat down to write the great Irish-American novel. And after, it was sort of not where he said after, after a certain amount of time, he had like a page and a half, and he decided that what he was going to do is go on a bike trip around, uh, you know, across the United States of America. Um, he did that. In 1988, he returned to one of the places he had ridden past, Miracle Farm, near Burnham, Texas, where in addition to working with children from broken homes, he attended the University of Texas, where he received his BA. And then after a brief trip, trip to Japan, where he met his wife, he moved to New York and began publishing. He hasn't looked back since. He's the author of many celebrated novels, uh, many of my favorite short stories, uh, the novels, of course, include Let the Great World Spin and Transatlantic. And my guess is that most of you, if you have braved the Colorado not very cold to be here tonight, that uh, you already know his work. You know his novels, you know their historical breadth, their imaginative audacity. You know how McCann's work demonstrates the ways that narrative, the stories we tell, the stories we listen to, the stories we tell about the past, the stories we invent about the past, the stories we tell about the past and the present that make those, make it all much more real, much more present to us, are what can span historical and cultural distance. And it's this aspect of McCann's work that truly fascinates me, that truly inspires me as a writer, the way that it, it occupies the blurry borders between fiction and fact and the way that it reminds us that truth is the uses of truth and the way in which truth is something that we move towards, the way that truth is that fiction can say something that fact cannot. Uh, it's a, oh, in a wonderful essay he's published, we were talking about this again tonight, we had a great session with students, uh, about his uh, grandfather and the way that he discovered his grandfather in the pages of Joyce's Ulysses. McCann cites Nabokov on the purpose of storytelling, which Nabokov says, quote, it is, quote, to portray ordinary objects as they will be reflected in the kindly mirrors of future times, to find in the objects around us the fragrant tenderness that only posterity will discern and appreciate in far off times when every trifle of our plain everyday life will become exquisite and festive in its own right. The times when a man whom I'd put on the most ordinary jacket of today will be dressed up for an elegant masquerade. Reflecting on this quote, McCann, go, McCann goes on, this is the function of books. We learn how to live even if we weren't there. Fiction gives us access to a very real history. Stories are the best democracy we have. We are allowed to become the other we never dreamed we could be. Please join me in welcoming Colin McCann. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you guys for coming out. Um, good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to, um, to be here. And um, I had a whole load of notes and um, things that I was going to read from. And um, I had a good session with the students earlier this evening. And, I, um, and I, th I think I might just try to, I might pop down to the notes uh, for a little while, but uh, to, 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 to read from the heart. It is uh, good to be in Colorado for lots of reasons. Um, one of the organizations that's very dear to my heart that I am um, actually chairperson of right now is called Narrative 4, it was born not too far from here in Aspen. Uh, now it's a sort of um, global organization um, and I will tell you, hopefully get a chance to tell you a little bit more about that as the evening goes on. Um, but also because I will always remember my first entry coming into uh, Colorado, struggling over Raton Pass on a bicycle. So I had a, an 18 speed Schwinn with the pannier bags on the back, panniers on the front, uh, a tent, a sleeping bag. And um, I'd been 
struggling in Texas with all sorts of things and I was coming over Raton Pass and lo and behold my uh, my rear spokes snapped. Now there are some cyclists among you who remember those, th those days when there used to be a thing called a freewheel on, 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 a, on, on the rear of a bicycle which was very difficult if you snapped a spoke on the wrong side of your, uh, of your wheel. Well, I snapped two, three, four spokes on the wrong side of my wheel coming over a tone pass and struggled over the pass and went to a little town called Trinidad, Colorado. Went into the local bike shop, it was called the Bike Doctor, and um, lo and behold, I ended up staying there for the next uh, four or five weeks. Um, the man taught me how to build wheels, uh, taught me how to fix my bike. I'd already been on the road for uh, well over a year, and um, I became part of his family and then did a little bit of racing in, 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 um, in Colorado, but mostly I was just a, a, a tourist on the bike. And um, really what it was all about was entering, um, entering a place that, 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 that wasn't my own, but being allowed to enter that place, which is kind of what Stephen was talking about in relation to uh, the idea of literature, to become alive in a place that is not necessarily one that you would have thought that your life could lead you to. Um, so I've been very lucky, um, and I had, a, I, I had a good time in, um, in Colorado. I went, actually went over then Independence Pass, and went all the way up to Dinosaur National Monument, and uh, um, the the isn't it the north west corner? Is that right? Yeah, so beautiful up by the Green and the Yampa uh, rivers. So I have a um, a strong relationship with um, with with Colorado, and it's nice to be here. Um, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, so I suppose what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about tonight is uh, the art of listening. Uh, the art of writing, and uh, maybe if we can get there, the art of peace. Um, and um, so I'm going to read to you from uh, a couple of sections from Transatlantic, and then talk to you uh, about where, where, and when this this novel came from. And then at the end of it all, um, I'd like to open it up for questions. So if, if if anybody has any questions, you have to let me know. Now I'm going to put on my timer so I don't bore you to death. Um, how do I do that? I got, an, I got my iPhone uh, just a couple of weeks ago and um, I, didn't, I only got my phone uh, two years ago. I think I'm a Neanderthal. Okay, right, here we go. All right, I'm going to begin uh, with just a little set, what, what I would call a set piece that takes place in, over the Atlantic. Uh, in just after that terrible bath of dying uh, called the First World War, uh, when two RAF pilots uh, leave Newfoundland, uh, two British RAF pilots leave Newfoundland in an attempt to become the first men to uh, fly across the transatlantic. This is eight years before Lindbergh, and uh, Lindbergh did it solo, of course. Their names are Alcock and Brown. He can feel it rising up in him, the prospect of grass, a lonesome cottage on the horizon, perhaps a row of huddled cattle. They must be careful. There are high cliffs along the coast. He has studied the geography of Ireland, the hills, the round towers, the expanses of limestone, the disappearing lakes, Galway Bay. There had been songs about that during the war. The roads to Tipperary, the Irish were a sentimental lot. They died and they drank in great numbers. A few of them for empire drank and died, died, drank. He is screwing back the lid on the flask of hot tea when he feels Alcock's hand on his shoulder. He knows before turning around that it is there, as simple as that, rising up out of the sea, as nonchalant as you like, wet rock, dark grass, stone, tree, light, two islands. The plane crosses the land at a low clip. Down below, a sheep with a magpie sitting on its back. The sheep raises its head and begins to run when the plane swoops. And for just a moment, the magpie stays in place on the sheep's back. It is something so odd that Brown knows he will remember it forever. The miracle of the actual. 
In the distance, the mountains, the quiltwork of stone walls, corkscrew roads, stunted trees, an abandoned castle, a pig farm, a church. And there, the radio towers to the south, 200-foot masts in a rectangle of lockstep, some warehouses, a stone house sitting on the edge of the Atlantic. It is Clifton, then. Clifton. The Marconi Towers, a great net of radio masts. They glance at each other. No words. Bring her down. Bring her down. They follow their line out over the village. The houses are grey, the roofs slate, the streets unusually quiet. Alcock whoops. He shuts the engines, angles in, flattens the Vimy out. Their helmets applaud, their hair roars, their fingernails whistle. And from out of the grass, a flock of long-billed snipe rises and soars. It looks to them like the perfect landing field, hard and level and green. Yet what they don't notice coming down are the nearby slabs of peat that lie like cake, the sharp cuts in the brown earth, the lines of wet string that run along the banks, the triangular ricks of earth off in the distance. They miss, too, the wooden turf carts that lie weathered and rain-pocked at the side of the road. They miss the angles of the slains leaning up against the carts. They miss the rushes grown long on the abandoned roads. They bring the Vimy down towards the ground. A flawless trajectory, almost as if they could lean out and scoop the soil up in their hands. Here we are. The plane suspends itself a foot from the ground. Their hearts thump in their shirts. They wait for the moment of touch. They skim the top of the grass. They hit and bounce. We are down. We are down, Jackie boy. But they know straight away that they are slowing too suddenly. A wheel, maybe? A burst tire? A snap? A tail fin? No cursing, no shouting, a s no panic, a sinking feeling, a dip, and then they realize it is bog, not grass. The living roots of sedge, they are skidding across a green bog. The soil holds the weight of the plane a moment, and they skid 50 feet, 60 feet, 70, and then the wheels dig. The earth holds, the vimy sinks, the nose dips, and the tail lifts. It is as if they have been yanked backwards by surprise. The front of the vimy slams into the soil. The back end flips. Brown smashes his face on the front of the cockpit. Alcock pushes back against the rudder control bar, bends it with pure force. A shot of pain through his chest and shoulders. Good Jesus, Jackie. What happened there? Have we crashed? So you have to read the novel to see if they crashed, actually. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, OK. All of this came from um, a story about possibly the greatest um, American statesman, um, that um, I can think of. Um, in 1845, Frederick Douglass, still a slave, uh, went on a ship to Ireland. He was refused to, um, to, 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 to go in the uh, first class cabin, even though he had the fare for it. And he went and landed in Ireland. It was his first time out of the United States. The reason, or one of the reasons that he left, was that um, his quote-unquote owners, who were in Maryland, uh, got wind of the great lectures that he was giving um, around the United States and a book that he had written, um, Narrative of the Life of a Slave. And they said that they were going to come and they were going to re-kidnap him and make a spectacle of his fame. So they wanted to send him to England to get money for the abolitionist cause. Well, in, in order to go to England, they would said they'd give him a rehearsal in Ireland, which sometimes happens. And here is this incredible man, um, a beautiful thinker, um, a person engaged with the world, staying with the wealthy of Irish. And in this particular scene um, that I'm going to read to you from, this is where he comes face to face uh, with the reality of actually what's happening uh, in the country. He's out in a carriage. He's with his publisher, uh, Richard Webb, um, and they're, they're 
driving cross country in a horse and carriage. Douglas gripped Webb's arm. Webb looked ill, a paleness at his throat. He did not want to talk. There was a smell out over the land. The soil had been turned. The blight had flung its rotten odor into the air. The potato crop was ruined. It's all they eat, said Webb. But why? It's all they have, he said. Surely not. For everything else, said Webb, they rely on us. Just so you know, this is the period of Emersonian self-reliance. And so much of what happened with the Irish famine is that they said, let the Irish rely on themselves. British soldiers galloped past, hoofing mud up onto the hedgerows, green hats with red badges like small splashes of blood against the land. The soldiers were young and frightened. There was an air of insurrection about the countryside. Even the birds seemed to howl up out of the trees. They thought they heard the cry of a wolf. But Webb said that the last wolf had been shot in the country a half century before. Creeley, the driver, began to whimper that perhaps it was a banshee. Ah, quit your foolishness, said Webb. Drive on. But sir, drive on, Creeley. At an estate house, they stopped to see if they could feed the horses. Three guards stood on the gate, stone-carved falcons at their shoulders. The guards had shovels in their hands, but the handles of the shovels had been sharpened to a point. The landlords were absent. There had been a fire. The house smouldered. Nobody was allowed past. They were under strict instructions. The guards looked at Douglas and tried to contain their surprise at the sight of a Negro. Get out of here, the guard said. Now, Creeley pushed the carriage on. The roads twisted. Hedges rose high around them. Night threatened. The horses slowed. They looked ruined. A gout of spittle and foam hung from their long jaws. Oh, move it, please, called Webb from the inner cab where he sat knee to knee with Douglas. Under a canopy of trees, the carriage came to a creaking stop. A silence pulled in around them. They heard a woman's voice under the muted hoof shuffle. It sounded as if she was invoking a blessing. What is it? called Webb. Creeley did not answer. Move it, man, it's getting dark. Still the carriage did not budge. Webb snapped the bottom of the door open with his foot and stepped down from the inner cab. Douglas followed. They stood in the black bath of trees. In the road they saw the cold and grainy shape of a woman. She wore a grey woolen shawl and the remnants of a green dress. She had been dragging behind her a very small bundle of twigs attached to a strap around her shoulders, pulling the contraption in her wake. On the twigs lay a small parcel of white. The woman gazed up at them. Her eyes shone. A high ache tightened her voice. You'll help my child, sir, she said to him. Pardon me. God bless you, sir. You'll help my child. She lifted a baby from the raft of twigs. Good God, said Webb. An arm flopped out from the bundle. The woman took the arm back into the rags. For the love of God, she said, the child's hungry. A wind had risen up. They could hear the branches of the trees slapping each other around. Here, said Webb, offering the woman a coin. She did not take it. She bent her head instead. She seemed to recognize her own shame on the ground. She's not had a thing to eat, said Douglas. Webb fumbled in his small leather purse again and held out a sixpenny piece. Still the woman did not take it. The baby was clutched to her chest. The men stood rooted to the spot. A paralysis had swept over them. Creeley looked away. Douglas felt himself become the dark of the road. The woman thrust the baby forward. The smell of death was overpowering. Okay. I should probably read something uh, with a bit more, bit more spark to it, but then... Um, let me tell you that um, the whole genesis of the novel began with the idea that Douglas had gone to Ireland 
And um, I began to see that he'd gone, you know, during the famine. And also, he had not talked about it. You know, he went around Ireland still talking about, um, about uh, abolition, talking about slavery. And part of me, at first, when, when, when I came upon the story of Douglas, I disliked him intensely. Um, I was like, why did you not speak out on behalf of my people? You know, why with the knowledge of what was going on and the poverty that was all around you when you were staying in the houses of the wealthy? Uh, you know, why was there not an opportunity for you to say something? Um, and I struggled for, with this for a long time. And um, then part of me began to shift and turn and, 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 and this whole notion, this sort of Whitman notion of, um, you know, um, uh, containing multitudes um, began to hit me. And it, it began to strike me that, that, that um, Frederick Douglass probably embodies more the notion that um, the essence of intelligence is the ability to hold contradictory ideas in the palms of your hands at the exact same time. And this is what I discovered in my own relationship to uh, Frederick Douglass and trying to talk about um, uh, why he went to Ireland and what it was that he eventually discovered about himself there. The politics still confounded him. Who was Irish? Who was British? Who was Catholic? Who was Protestant? Who owned the land? Whose child stood roomy-eyed with hunger? Whose house was burned? Whose soil belonged to whom and why? The simple way to see it is that the British were Protestant, the Irish were Catholic. One ruled, the other lay underfoot. But where did Richard Webb fit in and where did Isabel fit in? He would gladly have allowed himself to align with the desires of freedom and justice, but it was to his own known cause that he had to remain entirely loyal. Three million voices. He could not speak out against those who had brought him here to Ireland as a visitor. There was only so much he could take upon himself. He had to look to what mattered. What was beyond toleration was the ownership of man and woman. The Irish were poor, but not enslaved. He had come here to hack away at the ropes that held American slavery in place. Sometimes it withered him just to keep his mind steady. He was aware that the essence of proper intelligence was the embrace of contradiction. And the recognition of complexity was to be balanced against the need for simplicity. He was still a slave, fugitive. If he returned to Boston, he could be kidnapped at any time, taken south, strapped to a tree, whipped. His owners, they would make a spectacle of his fame. They had tried to silence him for many years already, no longer. He had been given a chance to speak out against what had held him in chains, and he would continue to do so until the links lay in pieces at his feet. And he thought he knew now what had brought him here. The chance to explore what it felt to be free and captive at the same time. It was not something that even the most aggrieved Irishman could understand, to be in bondage to everything, even the idea of one's own peace. His body, his mind, his soul had for years served only for the profit of others. He had his own people to whom he was pledged, three million slaves. They were the currency of his freedom. What weight would he carry if he tried to support the Irish too? Their agonies, their ambiguities, he had enough of his own. And so the barges passed, a river of food afloat. The sun went down over the slate rooftops of Cork. And the final piece I'm going to read to, to you from is from, or the second final piece that I'm going to read to you from, um, is from another great American statesman who is also involved with the, with, with the idea of peace. Because essentially what this novel tries to do is tries, tries to talk about peace. These two fighters from the RAF who come out of the World War I 
and take a basically a boat of air and two Rolls Royce engines and land it in Galway. See, now you don't have to read the book. Now you know they actually didn't crash. Um, uh, they, what they were doing is they, they were taking the war out of the machine. They replaced the bomb bays with petrol tanks. In another way, Frederick Douglass was taking the war out of the machine by talking about, um, by, 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 by talking about dignity, human dignity and freedom and, 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 and why we should not be owned. Another person who was distinctly interested in peace. And then the other person to me in Irish history, in contemporary Irish history in, in, in particular, and probably the best story of the, the, the end of the 20th century, the beginning of the 21st, was the story of Senator George Mitchell, who went uh, back and forth uh, to Ireland at, in his early 60s, um, and when he'd just become an, a, a new father, in fact, at the age of 64, went back and forth to Ireland for three years and helped us to negotiate uh, our peace process. And one of the reasons that I wanted to write about peace is because it's a very difficult thing to write about. Um, there is a, 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 a French philosopher, Montaigne, who says that, that, that happiness writes white. In other words, it's like you throw white ink against a white page. There is no relief. There's, you can't understand what it says. In the same way, peace is a very difficult thing to write about. It's sort of lofty and up there, and has to be sort of um, in opposition to, um, to, to, to war. But what Douglas did, and what Mitchell did, and even what Alcock and Brown did, was that they enabled stories to infiltrate that place where the um, uh, where, where, where the war had operated, and they made people's lives valuable. So this is a little piece about um, George Mitchell, who um, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about him, about him perhaps later on if I get a chance. Uh, he lives nearby to me in the Upper East Side of New York. Uh, he was the senator from Maine, as you probably know, Speaker of the House, second most powerful man in, in the United States after Clinton, and Clinton sent him across to, uh, to Ireland. A wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man. Um, and this is um, just a little section from, from the book. But I had to go to him and tell him that I wanted to make, to make a fiction out of him. That was, a, that, 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 that was a tough thing. He says, you want to make me into a fiction? In the end, I ended up working with his wife, Heather Mitchell, who was just fantastic and very kind to me. And um, she said to him, George, you should let this guy, um, you know, write, write about you. And he said, why? She said, well, you've written three books about yourself and nobody's read them. <laughs> Give this guy a chance. He's well aware that there are some out there who think they have him on an endless looping string, the judicial puppet, peace and duty. But it doesn't bother him one bit, even when they draw him glum and dangling in one of their crude newspaper cartoons or their backhanded jibes. There's something fierce about him. He has earned the right to part the darkness slightly, to go with them into the corners. What the Irish themselves worry about is that they will somehow keep on delaying the process, but he will not allow it. The endless river run, river run, river run. He will be over 80 years old when Andrew goes to college. The father mistaken for the grandfather, the distant ancestry, all those ancient ghosts. There were 61 children born in Northern Ireland the day that Andrew was born. 61 ways for a life to unfold. The thought slides a sharp blade of regret down the core of his spine. His son is just five months old now. And he can count on just four hands the amount of days he has spent with him. How many hours has he sat in the stark chambers listening to men argue about a single comma or the placement of a period when all he wanted to do was to return to the surprise of his very young child. Sometimes he would watch them as they talked the Irish, saying very little or nothing at all. Kites of language 
clouds of logic drifting in and out, caught on the moving wave of their own voices. He heard certain phrases and allowed them to take him over the treetops into what the Northern Irish called the yonder. Immersed in the words, sitting at the plenaries, waiting, the bitterness in the room, the cramped maleness, a relentless solicitude about them. They would hold up a hand and tell people they did not deserve the reverence, no, but it was plain to see that they needed it. Some days he wishes that he could empty the chambers of all those men, fill the halls instead with women, the short, sharp shock of 3,200 mothers, the ones who picked through the supermarket debris for pieces of their dead husbands, the ones who still laundered their gone son's bed sheets by hand, the ones who kept an extra teacup at the end of the table in case of miracles, the elegant ones, the angry ones, the clever ones, the ones in hairnets, the ones exhausted by all the dying. They carried their sorrow, not with photos under their arms or with public wailing or by beating their chests, but with a weariness around their eyes. Mothers and daughters and children and grandmothers too, they never fought the wars, but they suffered them blood and bone. How many times has he heard it? How often were there two ways to say just one thing? My son died. His name was Seamus. My son died. His name was James. My son died. His name was Patter. My son died. His name was Pete. My son died. His name was Billy. My son died. His name was Liam. My son died, his name was Charles. My son died, his name was Cahill. My son, my son's name is Andrew. And I always think about that, well, sorry, excuse me. Um, when, I, um, when I see Senator Mitchell, um, and I see him speaking now in, in various places around the country, he can look at his son, Andrew, and he can know the age of the peace process because he knows the age of his own boy. And I think that's the most, most amazing thing. 16 years since, uh, and, and the peace is rocky at times in Northern Ireland, but it is still there. And that's the most incredible thing. And so um, the last piece I'm gonna to read to you from this book, and then I'll go on and um, go elsewhere, is that um, I wanted to write for him a myth. This is long before I really got to know him. I should tell you that, you know, um, the day this book got published, um, I ran over to George Mitchell's house because I was going to I was going to launch it in in in, in Belfast, um, and I went over with two copies of the book for him and his his wife, right? And um, I dropped them off. They were coming out of their apartment complex in Park Avenue, and um, they were hopping into a car, and um, he called me back and he says, "Colm, come here." He says, um, say thank you to the people of Northern Ireland for me. And I was like, yeah, fair enough, sure, sure, sure. And then uh, I hopped in my own taxi, I was going out to JFK, and I started thinking about what he said. He didn't say, say hello to the people of Northern Ireland. He didn't say, give my regards to the people of Northern Ireland. No, he was saying thank you to them. And I think that that's the sort of person that, 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 that Senator George Mitchell uh, was, one of those like um, politicians that come al along once in uh, a lifetime, and luckily enough, help you to uh, uh, change the world. It is possible. So this is a little myth, a half page, that I wanted to write about the peace process, because as you can already tell, uh, the Irish don't shut up. Um, and, oh my God, is there anyone from Northern Ireland here? There is, there's a couple of people, yeah, yeah, oh God, there's at least one person from Northern Ireland. From, uh, Okay, my mum's from Northern Ireland, I'm allowed to say that. There's no one worse than the Northern Irish for not shutting up. <laughs> and can you imagine like uh, Reverend Ian Paisley when he's talking about Irish politics and you know, he's in a plenary or something like that? He'd be going like, for 700 years, Mr. Chairman, you know, like, and you know, 698 of those ago. Um, you know, and the Irish are great. Uh, Frank McCourt used to say um, uh, that the, the definition of Irish Alzheimer's is that you ac absolutely forget everything except the grudge. <laughs> in 
It is as if in a myth he has visited an empty grain silo. In the beginning he stood at the bottom in the resounding dark. Several figures gathered at the top of the silo. They peered down, shaded their eyes, and began to drop their pieces of grain upon him. Words. A small rain at first, full of vanity and history and rancor, clattering in the emptiness. He stood and he let a sound metallic around him until it began to pour and the grain took on a different sound and he had to reach up and keep knocking the words aside just to get a little space for himself to breathe. Dust and chaff in the air all around him from their very own fields. They were pouring down their winnowed bitterness and in his silence he just kept thrashing, spluttering, pushing the words away, a refusal to drown. But what nobody noticed, not even himself, was that the grain kept rising around him. And the silo began to fill and he kept rising with it. And the sounds grew different, word upon word, falling around him, building beneath him and now... At the top of the silo, he has clawed himself up and he has dusted himself off and he stands there equal with the pourers who are astounded by the language that lies below them. They glance at each other. There are three ways down from this silo. They can jump, into the, they can fall into the grain and they can drown. They can jump off the edge and abandon it or they can learn to sow it very slowly at their feet. That's it. Thank you. How are we doing? Well, see, I still I haven't figured out how to do this thing. Okay, perfect. Um, so um, I want to just talk a few minutes about uh, about peace and um, and 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 um, and reconciliation and these ideas of stories and storytelling and listening. Um, so I grew up in, in, in the South, I grew up in Dublin, in the Republic, um, but the North was enormously important to me because my mum came from there, she's from Garva, and I used to spend my summers there. And I remember experiencing the, the simple amazement of crossing a border, uh, and, and suddenly the post boxes were not green anymore, but they were red, and crossing a border, and suddenly the soldiers had guns, crossing a border and being stopped, um, and having to get off the bus and move buses when we, when we, when we got to Armagh. Um, and so much of my youthful um, questioning uh, when I was growing up revolved around the North. I wanted to know what was, what was happening. You know, why were people being kidnapped and murdered and raped and shot? And why did I have to disguise my Dublin accent uh, when I was on the streets of Garva town um, near Coleraine in County Derry? So, now, when I think about those days, I think about like having written about uh, uh, Northern Ireland in a book called Everything in This Country Must, and then most recently then in Transatlantic. And, and, um, and I have to ask myself, do I believe in literature as a way to shape history? Um, it's an important question to me and a provocative one, um, certainly because I mess with history and I use fiction and non-fiction. Um, in, in different ways. But I think that if I didn't believe in literature, that I might have to been, have been one of those who would have believed in the gun. And I don't believe in the gun. I still don't believe in the gun. So there's only one way for me to go, um, or maybe two, uh, one towards despair and the other towards storytelling. Um, and it's not just for the Irish peace process that I talk to you about storytelling or the Middle Eastern peace process which Mitchell also went across to try to negotiate um, a, 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 a treaty in the Middle East, and he didn't get very far. But not just for these places, but for many, many other places of, of loss. And I don't pretend to know anything about um, the experience in the Middle East, and I'll not try to make a pronouncement. And I am also very aware that the idea of peace um, strikes some people as a sentimental notion, that it is impossible and that even its pursuit is in vain. Well, I would tend to agree eventually that peace might be impossible just because of human nature, but I do not think that the pursuit of it is impossible, and I do not th think that the uh, pursuit of it is in vain. And um, this is where I come to the, um, uh, the notion of um, pessimism. Uh, and, and, and optimism. I had a chance to talk to Steve today uh, about um, Sam Beckett, and. Um, you know, I pronounced um, Sam Beckett to be one of the great optimists of our times. 
um, which generally brings a laugh from people who know anything about uh, Sam Beckett. Um, but 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 Beckett, um, I think Beckett was one of those th th those people who was an optimist in 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 the face of the deepest cynicism um, that, 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 that he confronted. I think he was one of those very strong cynics about human nature and, and, and about belonging and, and, and about existing. But he was also the sort of person who, who would say that, uh, you know, no matter, try again, fail again, fail better. Uh, he was also the sort of, sort of person who would say, can't go on, must go on. He would also the sort of person who would say that I drink from the vivifying, um, the vivifying waters of failure. So, um, what's interesting to me and uh, is that I think, in general, when it comes to notions of peace and when it comes to notions of war and when it comes to be able to write about it, the cynics have it very easy. Um, cynics have their world neatly folded and prepared. Um, in my own experience, there's nothing more uh, infuriating to a cynic than to turn the tables and call him or her a sentimentalist. Because sometimes you get called, ah, oh, because you believe in the fact that the, the human nature can do these things. Ah, you're, you're sentimental. But I think the cynics are the ones who are sentimental because they live in the cloud of their own immediate understanding. They are not prepared to go outside the territory of themselves or their own thoughts. And it seems to me that this lack of ability to travel, this lack of ability to journey, the lack of ability to break out through other places is inherently sentimental. Um, and that the job of a really good optimist, a per person who's operating in the world, like somebody like Senator Mitchell, is to acknowledge how shitty it is, to acknowledge how dark it is, to acknowledge how human nature is twisted and torn, to get down there with, with, with the worst of them, whether it be uh, you know, the, the, the loyalist side or the, or, or the Irish Republican side, and, and acknowledge uh, history, acknowledge all the darkness, and then say, but so what? We have acknowledged that. Um, uh, an optimist will be uh, able to be as muscular as the cynic and then move away from the cynic. Um, because I think they, uh, cynics are cursed by their own rigidity and they are limited by the notion that human nature itself is limited and that goodness cannot occur. Um, I think. Uh, optimists are generally smarter and more fluid than the cynics because they have the courage of their own potential failure. Um, and I think the very best of optimists are able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe, uh, with any cynic. In fact, a good optimist might be able to beat the cynic at his or her own cynicism. Embrace difficulty, that's the thing. Um, and so when we talk about peace, we also know that it's the most difficult thing to ma maintain. It's even more difficult to create. War can happen so very easily. One quick bullet will allow that. But peace has to happen over and over and over again. That's a challenge, not just to find peace or to write about peace, but to make it a potential human trait, which is all very idealistic, yes. But I'd rather be the man wearing his heart on a sleeve and then to be the cynic in the corner of the room. So um, I digress here for just a second because uh, I had something happen to me um, recently that I, that, that, that I will tell you about. Um, when I was in, uh, president of this um, organization, Narrative 4, we had a conference in New Haven. And um, I was coming home from a dinner on the first night of the conference. And um, I came up upon a man on the street who was uh, beating a woman. Um, and all these people were fleeing from around. And I um, sort of went up and um, probably stupidly uh, got involved. And I told the, the guy to please, no, I didn't say please. I said, leave the, leave, uh, leave, leave the woman alone. She was on the ground. She was, uh, and he was towering over her. And she was screaming at him. And he did. He left her alone. Um, and he looked at me for a long time. And I said, I'm going I'm to call the police. Uh, and um, uh, he looked at me, long time, big guy, white guy, big neck, looked like a quarterback, and uh, he left her. And then I went down and got him, uh, when, when I noticed that he turned the corner and gone and left the scene completely, I went, um, got down eye level with the woman and said, um, 
Uh, yeah, are you all right? She says, yeah, I'm all right. I said, do you want me to call the cops? She said, no, don't call the cops. I said, are you sure you don't want me to call the cops? I said, she said, I'm sure, just leave me alone. So I said, okay. I've done my Boy Scout thing for the day, finished and done. Um, and, um, you know, I could go back to the hotel and go have a drink. So I went back up to the hotel. I was talking to my son, John Michael, on the telephone just outside the hotel. And, uh, and then uh, I woke up two and a half hours later going into an MRI machine. Um, I'd been attacked uh, from behind and uh, then I got knocked out and um, was kicked around several times and uh, this is not a sympathy plea, you know, there's a lot of things happened, I sh um, shattered a cheekbone, I lost all my teeth, I got new teeth, see, um, and um, I had um, uh, severe headaches and, and, and things for, 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 for a couple of months. But the most difficult thing of all for me, right? was, first of all, thinking about the fact that in this country a woman gets hit every nine seconds. Um, also dealing with my own thing about getting hit from behind and not having a chance to stand up to this guy and trying to be macho about this whole thing. And um, I wasn't able to write for the whole summer. It happened to me on June 28th and all the way through till, till um, September um, I was unable to do it. But the guy got arrested and the court got in touch with me and they said, because I was unconscious when he, um, when he kicked me, first he knocked me out, and then, then he kicked me when I was down, and that they were bringing severe charges against him. And I had to write um, what's known in Connecticut courts, maybe you have them here in Colorado, maybe they have them everywhere, as a victim impact statement. Yeah, do you guys have that? You know, you do? Uh, well, it's the first thing that I wrote um, for, uh, about three months and um, I got just a chance to tell very simply what happened to me. I was out, I was at a conference on empathy of all things and, uh, and this guy, and then I had to, to, I had to figure out um, what should happen to this guy, you know, because he's been charged with, with a felony, five years in prison, um, which would probably be, be knocked down. And um, I had to try and figure out you know, what was my own relationship to this. And I said, in, in the statement I said um, that I forgive him for what he did, but I would never excuse him. And I wanted him to own it, and I wanted him to have it for the rest of his life, but I didn't want him to go to jail. Um, and because I don't think that the, 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 the jail does any good. Um, but that whole process was amazing to me because it gave me a chance to understand uh, what I was thinking. So by sitting down and writing about it, I was finally able to get rid of it. And the only reason I'm able to talk to you about it tonight, and I really haven't talked about it to, 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 to very many people at all, the only reason I'm able to talk about it tonight is because the guy has finally been charged uh, and uh, you know, all the stuff is, um, is, is, is sorted. Um, and I believe that the reason I was able to do so was because I was given a chance to, uh, to tell my story. Now, the thing about it is, there's so many people in the world who don't have a chance to tell their story. And one of the privileges of being a writer is to inhabit um, the other and the supposedly anonymous to try and make that story uh, valuable. Which leads me to um, all full circle to my idea about narrative four and my um, time spent in Colorado. Uh, I spent a week in the mountains with a group of writers that include Terry Tempest Williams, uh, include um, uh, Reza Aslan, Asaf, Asaf Gavron, David Robleski, Colorado writer. Uh, I, I'm gonna leave all sorts of people out, I shouldn't, but um, there were 15 of us got together. And as writers, we said, what is it that we share? What is it that we own? And what is it that we can bring to the world, apart from just our books that we can do? And we, we, we landed upon this idea of narrative exchange. So if you step into my shoes and I step into yours, I tell your story, you tell my story. This is what we do. And so um, uh, a, a Colorado um, native, um, Lisa Consiglio, uh, set up this organization called Narrative 4, where we now have organizations uh, in, in Ireland, in Rwanda, in Israel, in Palestine, in Mexico, uh, in Colorado, in um, Newtown, Connecticut, very focal point for us, uh, and uh, in lots of places all over the United States where people come together to exchange stories. 
And uh, just last night in Washington, D.C., the kids from Newtown, Connecticut, who went through that terrible experience uh, two years ago, uh, had a gun rally, um, a, gun, a gun control rally in, um, in Washington, D.C., and that was through the auspices of um, Narrative 4. And that's the sort of thing that, that breaks my heart and also makes me believe um, in stories and storytelling and the value of them. And um, as a writer, I think there, 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 there is nothing more that, that, that I could say than um, I'm very deeply grateful to be able to tell stories, right? And also to, uh, to believe that I have access to the stories of other people. And um, I'd like to open it up now to, to, to some questions and some comments, um, if anybody has them. Thank you very, very much. So my role is, uh, is to repeat the questions okay. for the uh, viewers at home. For me. Yeah, <laughs> for you and uh, you those are questions. Go ahead. Thank you. So the, the question is, how did your cross-country bike trip, which you took uh, very early when you were beginning to, uh, to write novels, how did that change the way in which you approached uh, uh, people and, and writing in general? Well, I, I think the way it changed me was that, 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 that I, didn't, um, I didn't really want to, to, to necessarily uh, write about myself anymore. Now, um, one thing that happens in, in, in writing courses is that the teachers will tell you, um, the, and they're absolutely right, by the way, they, you, know, you should write about what you know about. Well, I kind of believe uh, that the, a better way to say that is you should write about what you don't know about. In other words, you, uh, you, you imagine the lives of others, and in imagining the lives of others, you get to know what you knew, but you weren't entirely aware of. Because it's philosophically, logically impossible to write what you don't know, right? It's just, it's just impossible. But if you write towards what you want to know or what you seemingly don't know, you will discover things about um, uh, people and yourself uh, that, that are there. And it's the same thing with stories and storytelling. That's why we listen to stories. You're discovering things that you don't know um, about the world. You're, you're making a leap into others. And this empathy that we have, this little circus that's in our brain, and scientists have done studies on it, that if, 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 if I tell you my story uh, and I see that you're listening, my brain starts to fire in all sorts of ways. But if even better, if you tell me my story and I tell yours after listening to you, the brain is like an absolute carnival. And I suppose that early bike journey was an exercise in learning that everybody's story matters. And, and this is very important to me. I used to only think that, that, that the stories of the poor were, 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 were privileged in a way, that I had more of a responsibility towards poor people. It wasn't until I wrote Let the Great World Spin that I began to write about wealthier people in different circumstances, and, um, and, and um, I began to understand that no matter how rich, no poor, no white, nor black, or whatever it happens to be, everybody has a, has a valuable story, which sounds sort of twee, but it's true. Mm. Other questions? Please. So the question is uh, is about uh, the way in which Joyce wrote about Ireland when he was outside of Ireland, and what's your <clears throat> take on the relationship between where you write about where you're from and where you are now? I think it's a, it's, it's a very important question to me. Joyce said to, in a letter to Frank Budge, and he says, I've been so long out of Ireland that I all at once hear her voice in everything. Um, and so in a certain way, what he was doing is that what I think a lot of emigrants did, and maybe a lot of what your forefathers did, or maybe even their first generation people here, we leave paradoxically in order to remember. And certainly for me, 
I left in order to, to remember. This is not a form of nostalgia, but it is a form of engagement with the culture. Other writers stay because they want to stay with, the, with, 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 with that present tense that's there. Me, I needed to get away. For me, being an immigrant was kind of like um, wounding myself or cutting myself in order to remember and sprinkling salt. You know, there, there are truck drivers in order to stay awake. You know what they do is that they, 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 they'll light matches sulfur and smell the sulfur or they'll like cut themselves and sprinkle salt and just literally to stay awake. In the same way, there are emigrants who, who go away in order to stay awake to what, to, to, to what their own culture is. Or, uh, and sometimes you're aware that sometimes you might even die uh, in the suffocatingness of it. For me personally, I mean, Joyce left on purpose, Beckett left, you know, and, and so on. For me personally, I just was curious. I wanted to be like, you know, get a, you know, come over here and be like Jack Kerouac. In the end, I ended up, ended up, ended up staying. I didn't leave because of the church, didn't leave because of money, didn't leave because I didn't have a job or anything like that. I was in a pretty good position. But um, I do think it's a fascinating relationship um, for, for, for the writer. And, and finally, just in relation to that, um, what's really difficult, 20th century was about exile. I think the 21st century is about return. And Brodsky said it in advance. He says, you can't go back to the country that doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And one of the hardest things is to go back to a country that you don't recognize anymore. Yeah, okay, so the question is about um, appropriation of voice. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, uh, Jake points out about uh, the way in which this is something that's challenged him as a writer. Where are the lines about, or are there lines, or how do you come at the question of writing about these lives that you haven't lived? Right. Well, in, 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 in relation to, to, to narrative four, it's very easy. I mean, um, it's just you talk to the person who's there and you tell that other person's story. But your deeper question is about my process as a writer. Am I right? Yeah. How do I write about, like, otherness? And where, listen, you know, um, if I wrote about myself and only about myself, um, I would be sitting, writing about sitting on my fat arse in, a, in, in, in an apartment in New York, you know, uh, three kids, a dog, Layla, that would run around the reservoir every day. And, um, you know, and, and this is not something I want to, want, want to write about nor to read about. But what fascinates me is the, the lives of others. But there is a, a problem. I mean, is there cultural arrogance that you try to, to, to imagine yourself being other? Is it economic arrogance? Is it social arrogance? And this is one of the things that you have to deal with as a writer. But you write about what it is that, 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 that you're obsessed by. You write about something that, 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 that you feel is very important to you. So when I wrote Let the Great World Spin, it's a novel about 9-11. But, but it's in dozens of different voices that are not really mine. But ultimately, the irony of all of this is, when you write about others, you're really only essentially writing uh, about yourself. And that's where some sort of weird freedom comes about too. Um, but I don't, you know, maybe one day I'll write a memoir or something like that. I don't really want, at this stage, uh, to write a memoir, because I, I, I just think I have more freedom uh, in writing about others, but I have to take it on. I, it's a, it's a, it's a very deep moral question, and one that that, that I think about quite a lot. Maybe we have time for uh, one more question, but before we do, I want to remind you that we have books for sale uh, outside the theater, and uh, immediately following the reading, uh, Colin McCann will be going out to that table, sitting down. If you have books that you'd like signed, but is there one more question? Uh, yes. What happened to the guy? What? Did, did he end up in jail? Just because like, he didn't actually want to jail, <coughs> he was charged. When we, so the question is about um, 
yeah. about when you were talking about the, the your Sorry. when you were assaulted. Uh, what actually happened to the guy? Because you talked about how you didn't want him necessarily to be in jail. What was the penalty? So um, the um, the um, it's still ongoing, so I have to be a little bit careful uh, 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 about it. But he got charged with a, um, uh, a felony that got knocked down to uh, a misdemeanor. And so instead of five years in prison, he would get two years in prison. And then um, it, um, the suggested sentence now is a suspended sentence, so he'd be able to re maintain his job um, and uh, continue on. And so he will spend um, possibly uh, a month um, in, in, in jail and instead of two years in jail. But, you know, the whole, the whole thing about it was, um, you know, um, it actually reminds me of one other, one, one other funny story, but, um, but, 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 but trying, to, trying to figure out, you know, who this guy was um, without meeting him. I didn't want to go up to court, didn't want to see him, um, but also not wanting to ruin his life but also acknowledging all those lives of other people who get beaten up um, all the time. It happens on O'Connell Street all the time. I'm sure it happens here every now and then. And, and you have to make a, make a stand for it. Women these days are really making a stand on college campuses, which is, I think is just absolutely fantastic. A, it, 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 it is the necessity to sort of talk uh, about um, that sort of thing. Um, and. Um, Last um, but not least, I'll tell you a story about um, going, going to court. This is just about uh, two years ago. So I was walking through Central Park at about 2 o'clock in the morning. I'd been at a charity event downtown, and um, the cops stopped me, right, going across Central Park, and um, they um, issued me a summons. Uh, and I said, what's the summons for? Well, apparently you can't walk in Central Park in New York between 1 o'clock uh, and, um, and, and 5 o'clock in the morning, right? This is ridiculous. I never heard of this before. So I decided to go down and fight the summons. And um, so the judge is there at the top, and I walk in, and I'm waiting for my case to come up. And he says, um, he looks at me, he says, so, so, Mr. McCann, what were you doing skulking around Central Park <laughs> at, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning? Uh, I wasn't skulking, Your Honor. I was doing my, my, my civic duty. He says, what was your civic duty? I said, I was at a charity event. What were you doing at a charity event? I said, I was, I was doing a reading. And he said, well, what were you reading, Mr. McCann? I said, well, I was reading from a novel of mine, Let the Great World Spin. I, and, and, and his clerk said, oh, I read that novel. I read that novel. Right? <laughs> so um, he says, oh, is that right? He says, um, you know, and then he, 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 he knocks away the charge and does all these things. And, and then um, I'm, I'm leaving, and I'm going out the court um, onto Center Street, and two cops come up beside me and say, the judge wants to see you in chambers, right? <laughs> So I come back down to Chase Dare, he's going in his gown, and he says, oh, tell me about your writing and stuff like this. And, and um, so I talked to him a little bit about my writing, and he says to me, well, you know what, guess what, uh, my wife writes too. <laughs> you know where this is going, right? So he says to me, um, you know what, um, would, you, would you be willing to have a look at her memoir? And I says, quite frankly, my honor, I'd rather be I'd rather be fined for walking in Central Park. <laughs> That's one of the curious things about like like living living your life life as a novelist. But anyway, uh, thank you very much and have a good night.